Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to um, the next session of POTSI on coordination. So just to remind everyone, the, um, the format will be um, a five minute um, short synopsis of results followed by um, uh, a certain number of, uh, by, by questions. Um, our first speaker today is going to be Fabian Dufoulon. Um, from Technion University, and he's going to be talking in, about um, his the paper, Can Uncoordinated Beeps Tell Stories? So I'm going to switch over to Fabian. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, uh, so I should start now, right? Yes, please. Okay, uh, this is joint work with Jenna Burman and Geoffroy Boquet from Université Paris-Saclay. At the heart of this work is the following question. Uh, what can beeps give you, or what can they give you in a very harsh distributed setting? First, what are beeps? Well, they're one of the simplest communication signals possible. Beeps transmit no content. The only information they transmit is the fact that someone communicated. Now, concretely, you can think of a beep as a burst of sound, a burst of light, or a burst of wireless energy. And such a weak communication mechanism, mechanism is one, general, two, surprisingly efficient in certain cases, and three, may help us better understand distributed systems that emerge from natural phenomena, for example, firefly swarms. The idea being that some of the issues we run into with the beeping communication mechanism may also come up in the weak communication mechanism in these systems. Now, in this work, we consider the uncoordinated beeping model. In this model, we have a communication graph G. Nodes represent devices, and edges represent whether two devices may communicate with each other. Now, nodes have no knowledge of the graph, but they have some upper bound on the maximum degree. And nodes have no unique IDs. Now, time is divided into rounds, and in each round, nodes first compute what to do, and then they either listen or beep. If they listen, then they get the following information, at least one of their neighbors beeped. If they beep, then they receive no information during the round. Let's take an example. We have this node V, which listens during some round, and it has three neighbors. In both situations here, on the left and on the right, it, node V receives beep, so it does not distinguish both situations. That is, despite that, if you look, at, despite the fact that if you look at these situations on the left and on the right, you have different nodes beeping and different uh, number of nodes beeping. The only thing we can distinguish, the only situations we can distinguish, are situations in which no node, no neighboring node is beeping, and some neighboring nodes are beeping. So this, this is a very weak communication mechanism. And we want to study it in a very harsh setting, the uncoordinated start setting. In this setting, nodes wake up in some arbitrary round. They do not wake up upon hearing a beep. And this means that two nodes may have arbitrary different round values. This means that any two nodes may have arbitrarily uncoordinated local views of time. And in this very harsh setting, the following problem is interesting. The two hop desynchronization problem. It's basically a variant of to have coloring, but instead of choosing different colors, not choose different rounds within distance two. Now, one very first, at first glance, clear motivation is the following. A to have synchronization solution provides strong interference control, which is always good in these types of uh, uncoordinated settings. A second motivation comes from related work. In this setting, there has only been two previous studies uh, in the beeping model. The first considered one -hop, the one-hop desynchronization problem. The second considered the MIS problem. And now, all subsequent results have assumed a stronger communication setting. So it is natural to ask, can, I, can two -hop problems, for example, to have this desynchronization problem, can it actually be solved in this setting? And what could block us from this, uh, from answering this question, what is an obstacle, is can nodes actually communicate information to their two hop neighbors in this setting? A nice generalization of this question is the following. Can nodes communicate non-trivial information to their neighbors? That is by non-trivial, it could be even a single bit. Right now, it's not clear if nodes can 
communicate a bit to their neighbors in the setting? Can they even actually talk to their neighbors? Right now, they can just send unary information. In our work, we show that we give positive answers. We show that using some coding techniques, we can implement a two-hop beeping primitive under the condition that nodes have an upper bound on the maximum degree delta. With this primitive, we can get the first two-hop desynchronization solution by extending a known solution. And finally, once you have the strong interference control of a two-hop desynchronization solution, you can basically get a message passing abstraction layer in which nodes can just broadcast messages. One small question, one question which is left open is, can you get to have beeping primitives without any upper bound on the maximum degree, without any knowledge uh, of the communication graph? Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be very happy to answer them. Are there any questions about this talk? Okay. Yes. Can I just ask? Yes, uh, please. How, uh, how tight do you need the upper bound to be? For um, the maximum degree. So there's um, in the two of beeping primitive and the two of the synchronization, it's basically the upper bound on the maximum degree to the power of four, which is really high and the lower bounds delta squared, uh, but you don't need to be tight. It just, it, you get that in the uh, round complexity. Uh, does that answer the question actually? Not sure. Yes, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Ask a question? Yeah, can I ask one? Yes, please. So uh, what is actually the, the um, like uh, stabilization time of this, of this process? How much time does it take until you mm. reach this desynchronization? So it takes um, log n phases and all, each phase is around delta to the power of four. So it's um, the upper bound on the maximum degree to the power of four, which is actually quite huge. Um, in theory, it could go down to uh, Delta to the power squared, uh, maybe even less. Uh, like there's a, a few things, but it's log n phases of something. And these phases right now, it's not super clear how you could get them uh, lower than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the nodes have a, a kind, of, kind of a natural termination detection because they hear all the neighbors after a while, each in a different slot. Mm -hmm. So um, they, do not terminate. Um, what happens is that they, uh, it's randomized. Uh, the top discrimination solution is randomized. So they're gonna, if you think of it in the one hop, it's basically like the one hop discrimination version where beeps, where nodes are gonna try to beep in different times by uh, shifting their rounds by one with some probability uh, half. And this is gonna do some kind of symmetry breaking. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, this uh, keeps going uh, as long as the algor algorithm keeps running. Uh, okay, we can uh, take the discussion to Zulit. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you for, um, uh, due to time constraints, we should probably move okay. on. Um, the next talk that we have scheduled is um, Noisy Beeps. Um, the paper is by Klim Efremenko, Galat Kohl, and Raghubanash R. Uh, Saxena. Um, I do, it does not look like I received a, um, a private message from the person who will be giving this talk. I wonder if, if anyone is here. Um, to give this talk now, or if we should um, just move on to the third talk with the, the hope that someone may come online. Okay. Can you see any of the authors uh, in the- I do not list? see them online either. I see. So um, yeah, so let's move on, I guess. Okay. Let's uh, move on then to um, the third talk scheduled. Um, so this talk is um, 
The title is uh, Pyrogi, Efficient Peer-to-Peer -peer Network Design for Blockchains. And um, the speaker will be Yvonne Mao. Um, uh, Yvonne, I am unmuting you and um, spotlighting your video. Okay. Um, can you hear me and see my screen right now? Yes. Great. Oh, we're, we're seeing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, in this presentation, we will be describing Perigy, an efficient peer to peer network designed for blockchain systems. Um, blockchain is a state machine replication for maintaining a public ledger of transactions across various nodes in a P2P network. In blockchain, there's no permissioning authority to decide which nodes to participate in the network. Since Bitcoin first launched in 2008, a number of distributed applications have emerged, including from established companies like IBM and Facebook that use the blockchain to remove any digital intermediaries. A key problem facing blockchain systems today is scalability. The Bitcoin network currently needs around one hour to confirm the transactions, while it's only a few seconds on Visa. If the confirmation latency is one hour, it's not possible to use broad Bitcoin at payments. It also faces problems with regards to the throughput and the storage. But in this talk, we will mainly focus on the confirmation latency. There are four layers in the blockchain system and many proposals have been put forward to improve the scalability in each of the layers. At the bottom, it's a P2P layer, whose function is to broadcast messages such as blogs or transactions to all the nodes in the network. Technicals such as compressing or coding blocks have been proposed to speed up the propagation at the layer. Above that, we have the consensus layer, the sharding layer, and the application layers, as you, as you can see. Since the P2P broadcast is fundamental to all these layers, making the P2P network efficient would benefit all of these proposals. So the question we focus on is, how can we structure the P2P top knowledge of the network so that the message propagation delay is minimized? Bitcoin uses a random top knowledge today, where each node selects its neighbors randomly. In the model shown here, the time taken to the time taken to send a message from a node to its neighbor is proportional to the distance between the nodes. If the top knowledge is random, then the shortest path between nodes could zigzag like this, resulting in a message propagation time that is much greater than the physical shortest distance between the nodes. A better alternative is a random geometry graph, where each node only connects to neighbors with a ball of certain radius around it. Here, the shortest path between any two points is pretty close to the physical shortest distance. But a random geometry graph is also not a very efficient solution in practice. In addition to the latency, today's internet is also very heterogeneous in terms of the processing power and the bandwidth across nodes. So finding an efficient top knowledge that takes these heterogeneities into account is a very non-trivial problem. In our work, we present Perigy, an algorithm in which a node selects its neighbors based on the, um, its past interactions with them. The main idea is that each node assigns a score to different subsets of neighbors based on how fast it relay blocks. It then retains a subset of neighbors with the best score and disconnects from the rest. To discover previously unseen but potential well connected nodes. Perigy nodes also form a connection to the small number of random neighbors periodically. Our algorithm is multi motivated by the multi arm bandit problem, where we think the different sets of neighbors as the arms. Our algorithm also naturally adapts to network heterogeneities, such as hash power, and the link latency, and the others, 
as shown via evaluations in our paper. We, we empirically evaluate our protocol on a simulated network of 1,000 nodes. Data for the geographical location of these nodes and the latency between them are obtained from the real-world measurement traces. For each node, we record the time in a message to take from to, um, <clears throat> for each node, we record the time a message take to propagate from the node to the 90% of the network. In this picture, the x-axis is the node index and the y-axis is the propagation delay. We compare our algorithm against the random top knowledge, the fully connected network, the geographical algorithm, uh, where, the, where they select the neighbors by the, um, by the continents, and the catamilla, which is a well-known structure P2P overlay. As shown, in this, as shown in the picture, our algorithm is more than 33% better compared to today's random neighbor selection. We believe our work is a first step and important questions. Um, the convergence behavior, the robustness against the eclipse attacks, and the performance on the node charm is, uh, are also left for our future work. Thank you. Thank you, Yifan. Are there any questions? Um, so do you have any theoretical bounds on the work or just simulations, Yifan? Um, um, in this paper, uh, most, of, most of our work are based on the simulation. Okay. So I have a question. Um, for multi-armed bandits, there is, um, I mean, one, one algorithm that is pretty effective at honing in um, would be something like multiplicative weights update algorithm. So, so the idea is um, it, it, it's, it's essentially, you know, it, it, to sort of handle the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Um, mm -hmm. have, you, have you looked at anything like using something like an algorithm like this, multiplicative weights updates? To, to handle the links, decide when you, when you um, sort of try a new random link and, and, and sort of like what, you know, how, like when you use the links that you already have. Um, yeah, uh, actually we did, uh, we did a several sim simulations to balance the uh, exploration and the exploitation. And, uh, and finally we find that, for example, uh, normally the, a node will have eight outbound neighbors and uh, we, we select the six subset of neighbors and we will switch the, uh, the other two neighbors to explore the uh, remaining uh, nodes. Oh, right, but I guess I'm just wondering, did it, um, I mean, have you tried the specific algorithm, multiplicative weights updates to, to make that selection? Uh, uh, sorry? The, the, there's a, a specific algorithm called multiplicative weights updates that has been used um, for the multi-arm bandits problem. Mm -hmm. Have you have you um, have you tried that? No. A specific algorithm. The algorithm is called multiplicative weights updates. Um, anyway, I can I I can just we can talk offline. Okay. Jared, I think there's a few questions on the chat. Ah, uh, yes. Um, uh, so, okay, the questions I see here. Um, doesn't your algorithm give more power to the stronger and discriminate the periphery? Um, that's from Guy Gordon. Um, and then there's another question um, from Matthias Grunman. Um, how does Peregree defend against eclipse, attack, eclipse attacks by an attacker controlling nodes that are well connected. I, I mean, I guess we have maybe, if you want to, maybe we have one more minute, if you want to address one of those two questions and the other one we could do offline. Oh, mm, the uh, the last question was to defend against uh, eclipse attacks is for our future work and uh, um, right now we can uh, right now we can um, prove that uh, um, 
Mm, there, there, there is some um, inference from this attack, but uh, we, we are working on that. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, so um, the next talk will be um, on the paper Deconstructor, Efficient and Robust Network Construction with Polylogarithmic Overhead. And um, the speaker will be Amitabh Trehom. Amitabh, um, I'm going to um, spotlight your video. Right, is it visible and can you hear me? We can. Okay, is my presentation is visible? Yes, it is. Right, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Jaren. Uh, uh, so I'm going to talk about our paper, Deconstructor Efficient and Robust. Oh, sorry, I've got the wrong slides. <laughs> Need to switch to the short version. Uh, right, that's, that's the short version, yeah. Uh, okay, certain time. Right, so uh, the paper is still the same. So Deconstructor Efficient and Robust Network Construction with Polylogarithmic Overhead. So this is joint work with uh, Seth Gilbert, uh, Gopal Panduragan, and Peter Robinson. And as you can see, it's a multi-continental uh, international collaboration. Uh, and it took a few years in the making, so it's a uh, long work. So Singapore, US, uh, Hong Kong, UK, right. Okay, so firstly, I'm going to introduce a new superhero from uh, DC Comics. And DC Comics, as you know, is Distributed Computing Comics. And the name of the superhero is Deconstructor, who's uh, D the Distributed Constructor, who happens to be the second cousin of Bob the Builder. Right, so now that uh, you know who Deconstructor is, let's see what Deconstructor does. So Deconstructor is the magic builder uh, who begins with any connected topology and very quickly, almost magically, constructed topology of choice. And of course, uh, Deconstructor is distributed, right? So let's uh, first see uh, which domain does Deconstructor work in, uh, as opposed to Bob the Builder. So it's in, he's in the world of uh, overlay and peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, the idea is you have a, uh, the last talk was very, let's say very useful for motivating much of what I have today, so I can do over this quickly. The idea is, of course, you have a collection of changing servers and a collection of uh, peers, and what you really want to do is build a good overlay uh, which is basically a good subset over a fully connected underlay. So, and usually you would want this subgraph to have low degree, low diameter, good expansion. And again, as a last talk motivated, the Bitcoin network is an example of a practical way to be a system, very useful one. Uh, moreover, as uh, again, from the last talk, and as we know, the communication topology is extremely important. Uh, and peer-to-peer -peer networks are reconfigurable. That is, you can choose the edges you want. Uh, moreover, there is churn that nodes can join and leave, and it can also be dynamic. Edges can change, and generally it's fault-prone. So what you really require is a quick and practical distributed protocol which can configure a network to a good topology. Now, good is something to be defined. So our target for this work was to, if you're given any initial connected topology, to converge quickly with a small number of, in a small number of rounds and in a practical manner to a good topology uh, distributed. And that was our target. So what are the goals of Deconstructor? First, as I said, you want to construct a good overlay topology uh, with small diameter and small degree, which should be routable with good expansion. What does it mean to be have a small diameter and a small degree? Basically, we're looking for order log n uh, diameters and degrees uh, for a good topology. It should be fast, so it should form from rapidly from any initial state, and we're looking for polylogarithmic rounds. It should be self-repairing, dynamic, and churn tolerant, right? So be able to uh, handle churn and topologies. It should be efficient, so you just want small messages. You want it to be practical, so we just want to be in sort of the congested model, only log and size messages, and low overheads. So low overhead here means that the intermediate degrees of any node should not go, uh, go beyond what it started off with or what is the final topology. So bounded degree increases. So because in, in one manner, you could have just one node, you know, connect to all the other nodes and then decide, okay, this is the topology I want to construct and tell them, right? So we want to avoid this kind of solutions. So there has been a lot of work, of course, in peer-to-peer -peer construction and maintenance. 
and some very well known uh, constructions for example chord and skip skip craft uh, chord record skip skip plus dex uh, so all of these are uh, constr uh, construction topologies uh, the one drawback for these are these are just fixed topologies so they end up with one particular topology uh, there is also the work of anguin uh, dan anguin and others which uh, could actually take uh, construct more than one topology a few other topologies uh, some of them have used large messages for example skip plus uses is in the local model and for example anguin and others are not uh, fault tolerant or churn tolerant whereas others like dex and skip plus are fault tolerant and there are some maintenance only peer to peer uh, algorithm like forgiving graph forgiving tree exceal and work by kunat et al 2005 right so what we are looking to is to get to the state of art in this and solve the issues with all of them so what we've come up with is a fully distributed synchronous protocol that from any arbitrary topology of n nodes will converge with high prob probability to a target topology uh, which is a topology with certain conditions but it you has all the nice topologies you want so graphs should have random parallel sampling, successor, successor mapping, and uh, delta permutation routing. So I'll skip those uh, for time constraint and refer you to the big present, longer presentation. Uh, and it's, it's in the P2P congest model, which uses only log and size messages. So it's worth looking at the model quickly. So the P2P congest model is basically the congest model extended to P2P overlay net reconfigurable networks. Uh, thanks for an anonymous uh, reviewer suggesting this name. Uh, so you have graphs uh, which are uh, varying from G1, G2 to all the way up there. So G1 is the initial network and initially nodes only know their neighbor with G1. For example, U here knows about A, B, C, A, B, and C. Uh, now it's a regular synchronous congest model. Uh, in each round, every node can send, receive, and process a message from uh, of a of size log and per neighbor. So now, for example, node U gets a message which has, which has the ID of a neighbor of C called D. And uh, D also gets a message which has a neighbor ID U, right? So now, finally, uh, the, in the P2P congest, you can also have a reconfiguration step. That is, nodes can add or drop edges. So if a node U knows the ID of node V, it can add or drop the edge UV. So for example, here, an edge UD is added and an edge CE is dropped. So that's basically the P2P congest model. So in this model, uh, we are able to uh, construct uh, a lot of topologies we're using time and message proportional to the mixing time and max degree of those topologies and for most of the good topologies this is only polylog n as an example of a good topology which is uh, which is nice is a p cycle a p cycle is a deterministic expander a deterministically constructed good expander which is basically a, a, a numbered cycle on a prime number of nodes where you have chord edges between multiplicative and inverses so we've discussed this a lot in the previous work called the dex the dex paper so we use this again as a running example in this paper, but our result formally is that we can, given you, you, you given any graph on N nodes and you have a certain target topology, which is a family of graphs uh, with maximum degree D and sampling time T, you can construct with high probability the P in order D, poly, poly T, poly log N rounds. So what this yields us is a lot of desirable topologies such as distributed expanders, zigzag product P cycles, et cetera, chords, skip graph, hypercubes, et cetera, all of them, in only polylog and rounds and messages. So we actually can do better than some specialized algorithms, right? Moreover, it's self-repairing. Uh, we need a, an additional condition here for locally checkable topologies. So some of these topologies, if you can add local checkability, you can just detect a fault. And then basically it's sort of simple because the algorithm itself is so quick, you can just run the same algorithm again uh, with some technical details to get back the self-repairing property. Moreover, this is an intuitive algorithm. It's quite practical to implement. It uses only recursive uh, divide and conquer. So it's quite a easy algorithm to understand at a high level. So here is the base, basic idea of the algorithm. So you initially you start with each node as a cluster in itself, and then you simply merge those clusters uh, till there's only one cluster left. So it's a recursive divide and conquer bottom up approach. Now the question is, what if the required topology you want does not exist for that particular size? So for example, you have certain N, uh, but you, for example, P cycles are only work only work for prime numbers of nodes. So here, the interesting trick is you go into virtual overlays. So virtual overlays is this idea which again has been used in the, in the past uh, in in a, in a number of uh, papers before. The idea is you and you can do this here in peer to peer because you can maintain virtual graphs. That is, uh, you have peers which are not really 
there, but they're being simulated by the real nodes. And as long as you can maintain mappings between the real and virtual, you can actually achieve these properties. The overall algorithm then runs like you have the virtual overlays, then you, for example, you have two good topologies, you are going to merge them into a single one, and the construction algorithm itself then goes divide and conquer. So here is a high level view of the algorithm itself. Uh, it basically is, is, is going to start with decomposing the graph into a number of trees, directed binary trees, and then you're going to do matching, uh, and you match up and you merge pairwise, and you recurse on this, and in the end you're left with just one. Uh, algorithm for details, I refer you to the long version. So of course, uh, so there are a number of things which can still be done. Uh, this could be self-stabilized for which we have some ideas. Synchronicity, can we move it to an asynchronous model? What about other fault models such as Byzantine, etc. Now there are some target, some topologies which do not fall into ours, uh, but for example, a random GNP graph can be achieved these. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. So if there are any questions, uh, Mr. Deconstructor or I would be happy to take them. Thank you. Great. I have a questions. couple of quick questions. That's okay, Jared? Okay. So first of all, uh, I'm trying to understand like the, maybe the memory model here. So do they remember only the message that they got in the previous round in deciding to place an edge or not? Or do they have a memory for all the message they got throughout history? Like no, how, how do the, the P2P congest model? I think that's my question. Right, right. So the P2P congest model as such as we have defined does not have any restriction on on uh, on the on amnesiac as another mm -hmm. another work I'm doing the amnesiac flooding, which has this property now. So I mean at least we did not restrict it to to past history, but uh, that's an interesting question. I I don't know, maybe it still works with just remembering. A small amount of history we haven't thought about it okay. actually yeah and, and the second question i have is that you're talking about mixing times but i, I couldn't figure out exactly where that comes in um, uh, so so you know uh when we have these uh uh so so essentially what's the algorithm what the algorithm is doing it's creating these uh, small members of uh, these smaller members of the family of of the graph you're going to construct later on and then when we have when we are doing the merge at that point, the one of the uh, one of the instances is creating the next larger member, and now this needs to distribute these virtual nodes over to others, which are just maybe connected by a single bridge initially for the merge step. So here you actually uh, you end up using random walks to find these uh, peers randomly, to which you can distribute all these extra vertices you uh, nodes you have vertices you have. So that's where the mixing time comes in. It's basically to find a number of a random nodes to which you can distribute uh, extra vertices you have. Sounds great. Great work, great talk. Thanks, Anton. Thank you. So okay. I had a follow-up question about that. Um, so in particular, with respect to um, Yifan's talk um, about how when you consider geometry, you're able to speed up <clears throat> um, the, the, um, the communication time in these, in these networks. Um, it seems like the type of topology you need to get good mixing time is is almost uh, you know quite a bit different than the type of topology that you would you would use if you were considering only geometry. Do you have any ideas about how one might be able to, to get both? So in order to try to get a, a topology that has you know good good mixing time, good expansion in particular, which would indicate you know somewhat random edges uh, versus on on one side in order to get you know the good properties of of the, the um, you know the the networks that you can you can maintain for your with your paper um, versus on the other side um, trying to keep into keep uh, geometry into mind, in mind in mind topology. That's that's very interesting. I, I don't think we've looked into that into detail. But uh, so one thing which happens is this 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 algorithm is sort of like a wrapper. So it's just taking any construction and has uh, the mixing time as a as a as a parameter. So, so obviously if it has a bad mixing time, it's, it's going to take longer. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but like you said, maybe for certain, uh, or for, for these kind of properties, maybe the algorithm can be uh, modified and maybe on, on the line of Andrea's question, uh, maybe can be modified uh, to use maybe deterministic methods or something, which instead of, instead of relying on our randomized methods for uh, of mixing time for finding 
nodes and I don't know how that will exactly work, but maybe it could be modified for uh, topologies which have bad mixing time. Uh, so that could be sort of an open open question actually. May I ask a question? Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, the, uh, the question is, Amitabh, is the following. It's very simple, maybe I missed something. How, how do the nodes know the target topology? Is the, is the target topology presented to each of them as input? Yes. Is it yes. with a set of properties or? Uh, <laughs> or yeah, I, I couldn't mention it in, in the short talk, but yes, they, they are given the, uh, they are given the property to begin with. They are given, sorry, the final topology they have to construct to begin with. Final topology. At, least the, at least the family. So remember, it's a family of topologies. So, so they know, for example, they're going to construct the piece cycle. And they know, say, say the size, say n. So I don't know the size. Okay. So, so they can work towards that. So maybe it can even work without knowing the size because they they just need to keep keep uh, incrementing till they can't increment anymore. So, okay. so they at least need to know the family. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's a couple of questions on the chat also. Yes, let's, what, why don't we, uh, maybe we should address those um, offline, uh, sure, given sure um, time constraints. So we still have three more. Um, sure. Thank you, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, Amitam. Great. Um, so uh, the next talk will be by George uh, Scratis. Um, and, um, yeah. okay, I think I've, uh, Okay, I'm, I'm spotlighting the video. Um, and um, I've unmuted you, I believe. Um, the, the, um, he'll be talking about the paper distributed computation and reconfiguration and actively dynamic networks. Okay, so I guess you can hear me and see my screen. Okay, I'll begin. So, well, um, thank you for having me here. This is a joint work with Othan Mikhail and Paul Spirakis. So let's begin. Okay, so in this work, we're interested in dynamic networks, but we want specific dynamic networks that have control over the edges of the network. That is to say that nodes are able to activate connections to new neighbors or deactivate connections that they already have. We also want you have no central coordinator, so it's the distributed system. Each node takes its own decision based on local information that it has. And normally in these dynamic networks, you might have distributed tasks that you want to solve. But in this work, since we can control the edges of the network, we want to take advantage of that and transform the initial network into a target network that has some good properties that we can exploit in order to more efficiently solve a distributed task. So this is the model that we have. We have always an initial connected network GS, like the one here on the right. We have a static set of nodes, so the nodes never change, but we have a dynamic set of edges. So you can imagine here that in this graph, all of the edges exist at all times, but they can either be active or inactive. So these four edges here are active, while these two here are inactive. We use a standard synchronous message passing model, and we assume that each node has a unique ID but nodes are only allowed to compare IDs between themselves. So no complex operation, just comparison. And we say that a node can activate an edge with another node, provided that they are distance to neighbors. So six and 20 here can activate this edge here. And any node can activate an edge that is incident to itself. So here are the problems that we wanna solve. We have two distributed tasks, leader election and token dissemination, and a transformation problem, the def D tree, which is to transform the initial network into a tree of def D. Now, the reason for the third problem is that if you can solve the third problem in sublinear time and you arrive at a graph that has depth logarithmic, then you can also solve the other two problems in sublinear time as well. So all of our algorithms basically solve all three of the problems at once. But now, uh, since we are in control of the edges, we want to add some way to quantify that cost that comes from activating and maintaining those edges. It can't come for free. So we introduce three measures. Now, all of them count edges that have been activated by the algorithm. So the first one counts the edges activated by the algorithm. So the second one takes the active edges, the activated edges by the algorithm per round throughout all rounds. It takes that maximum number. 
And finally, we do the same for the degree at the end. Uh, so we don't take into account the edges from the initial network. Now, all three algorithms that we have um, try to optimize the different measures that I have here, including time. And they all follow the same general strategy. That is, we have nodes that are partitioned into committees. Committees are groups of nodes that coordinate together. And uh, every committee is always organized into the same gadget network, depending on the algorithm. So for example, our first algorithm, every committee looks like a star. For the second algorithm, every committee looks like a wreath. And the algorithm works as follows. Each node forms its own committee. And as time goes on, committees compete with neighboring committees and they merge depending on, some uh, depending on their IDs that they compare. Until at some point we have a final network that only has a single committee left. And for example, if that's the star, then we would have solved the depth one tree problem. And then we could do leader election and token dissemination very fast. Uh, now, um, in this work, in order to calculate the time, what we do is we calculate the phases of the algorithm. That is always log n. We can't go below that. And we multiply that by the internal communication within the committees because committees need to communicate with others on, uh, on how to merge. So for example, in the star, this would cost one or two maybe because you'll, the, committees are very, the leader of the committees are very close to each other. While in the wreaths that have logarithmic diameter, you would require another log n value here. So it's a cost that you would have to pay. So uh, here are our results. So when we started, we said, okay, can we sort of disregard the maximum activated degree completely, so have it be linear, in order to optimize the other three uh, measures that we have. And this is what we did. This is why we use the star. After that, we said, OK, can we now optimize the degree? But in order to do that, like I said before, uh, since you can't have linear degree, and here we wanted a constant, we needed a graph that could not be a star, but be like a wreath, but the one I showed that has constant degree, but obviously it has to have a longer diameter, which is logarithmic, and this is what we pay here. And for the third algorithm, we want it to be something that has, oh, excuse me, values in between the first two for both time and maximum activated degree. And a uh, small remark here, this algorithm requires knowledge of the initial networks, the others do not. And we also have some lower bounds that show a clear distinction between the centralized and the distributed case, and also show that some of our algorithms are optimals in some measures. OK, so for our problems, um, as you might have seen from the previous uh, slide, uh, this model looks a lot like the previous one. But there are distinctions both in how you, uh, on the things you can do and both of the measures that you, do, that you use. So it would be nice to see whether one model can overtake the other or what are the clear differences between themselves. Another one would be to find an optimal algorithm for both time and maximum activated degree. Because at least to us, it seems that there is a trade-off. But we can only conjecture to that. We're not sure yet. Uh, finally, we have the lower bounds. Here you can see big gaps here that we could fill. And also, if we dropped the comparison uh, assumption that we have for the IDs, then all of almost all of those lower bounds then are worthless, and we would have to find them anew. And finally, the most important open problem, in my mind at least, is to depending on the underlying application that you have, and you are using this model for this. Uh, you can introduce new measures that could uh, fit whatever application you have. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, George. Questions? Did, did you have any particular measures in mind that you think would be relevant? Uh, okay, let's, one example that is in, has been in my mind lately would be, okay, since uh, s some of the motivation of this work was to try and uh, have a more abstract model from reconfigurable systems, for example, programmable matter, if you're aware of it, was, okay, instead of saying that we have um, constant activated degree, maybe we would want a specific value, say four or six, because the geometry of the programmable matter model I had and I wanted to try and simulate in a more abstract way has only each node having four neighbors or six neighbors or something like that. That could be one of them. Uh, yeah, uh, there are others, but this is the more most at least uh, interesting I have for um, checking. I see. Okay. Um, other questions? Mr. Speaker?
Okay. 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 Accept questions okay. from your co-author. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the methods here are deterministic, aren't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. All three of the methods here are deterministic. They're not random. Yes, yes. Good. If they were randomized, would, would there be improvements? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um, I mean, especially if you check the overlay networks, like I said, uh, randomized there seems to be most of the algorithms used because uh, it's, it seems much harder to coordinate the committees in a deterministic way. You, usually you want some randomness to break some kind of symmetries that are created and you want to break them in order to have them all coordinate and converge towards a specific place and randomization helps there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, um, George. Uh, the um, the next talk, um, the next two talks that we have scheduled that are both um, brief announcements. Um, so the first one is um, uh, on the paper um, titled "Noisy Beeping Networks," and um, the speaker is Ran Gellis. Ren? Yeah, okay, thank, thank you, you Jared. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, noisy beeping networks. This is a joint work with uh, Yagir Ashkenazi and Damir Lashem. And let me let, tell you a little bit about beeping networks in case we missed uh, Fabian talk in the beginning of this session. Uh, so we talk about a general network, a general graph of arbitrary topology. And we have very simple devices. Each device can only either beep or listen in synchronous sounds. Beep, beeping means just sending energy to the air. Listen just means listening if there is energy in the air. What nodes cannot do, they cannot detect collisions. So a node doesn't know if one of its neighbor has beeped or more than one. All that they can hear is just energy in the air, which means beeping. And so in this model, there uh, has been a lot of work. Uh, here I cited many of the works. I hope I didn't forget anybody. What I would like to talk about is the noisy beeping network model, which we introduce. And in the noisy uh, model, we just uh, add errors to this model. And when we talk about noise, we actually can model noise in two different ways. One of the ways is the uh, actually is the uh, way of the uh, talk uh, that uh, was missing in this uh, session, the talk of Klim, uh, uh, Gilat, and uh, Raghuvanj. Uh, so the way they uh, defined noise is transmitter, a sender's noise. In a sender's noise, the transmitter device may be faulty and may beep when it's not supposed to be, or may keep silent when it is supposed to be. What we define in this uh, uh, paper is what we call receiver's noise. In the receiver's noise model, the receiver unit is faulty. That is, sometimes the receiver misdetects a bit, or sometimes the receiver believes he, it heard a bit, but a bit while there was a silence. And uh, if you think about it, if we talk about uh, multi hop wireless networks, then receiver's noise is actually a uh, very relevant noise. If you think about like, this graph, this topology, you will see that with center noise, the central uh, device is completely blocked. All the time it will just hear beeps because all of these are faulty. Uh, constant fraction of them are faulty and constant fraction of them will beep all the time even if everybody is silenced. So in, with center's noise, uh, this topology you know, it's, is completely blocked and there is nothing that we can do. Okay, our main result in this model is a collision detection algorithm. Actually, it's a noise resilient collision detection algorithm and it takes log and bounds. In collision detection, I mean an algorithm that allows every node to learn whether none of its neighbors has beeped, exactly one neighbor beep or more than one. Okay, it's a randomized uh, algorithm, it uh, takes order of log n rounds and it succeeds with high probability despite the noise. Uh, obviously this is a brief announcement so I don't have the time to go into the details. We base our uh, algorithm on uh, coding techniques, specifically constant weight codes. 
we also show that uh, we show a lower bound. So we show that uh, actually you cannot do <coughs> noise resilient collision detection in less than log m rounds uh, with high probability. So this is the main technique that we introduce, but actually this is not the main, uh, what I like to think, it's not our main uh, result. The main result is actually the implication of this uh, technique. And what we, we show uh, actually is somewhat surprising is that if you take our noise resilient collision detection and compose it with other beeping algorithms, you get really nice results, really sometimes optimal results. The thing is that uh, when you compose uh, these two uh, algorithms, you can actually take algorithm in the BIP model that already assumes you have collision detection because you get collision detection for free by our uh, noise resilient method. And uh, algorithms that assume collision detection work faster. So as you can see here, uh, for collision detection, we show that this is tight, the log n, but also for coloring. So take the best uh, coloring algorithm for beeping model assuming collision detection, and you will get this uh, upper bound, this uh, time, uh, if you compose it with our collision detection method. And uh, the lower bound, this is actually the lower bound of the noiseless model, so it applies also for the noisy model, and as you can see, this is tied for large networks. Um, not uh, everything is solved for some other tasks like the uh, MIS and leader election, we still have a gap between what we can do in the noisy uh, model and uh, the currently known lower bound. So there is still future work, and by this I will conclude my talk. Thank you. Um, can I ask a quick question? Uh, so one, I don't see P appearing in any of your bounds. Right, so P is a constant, so we okay. hide by the order of Okay, and uh, just one very quick question. When you're talking about collision detection, you don't refer to sender collision detection, right? The sender, I mean, a beeping sender can still, still cannot distinguish between true. anything. Well, this is true. This is only receiver collision detection. Okay, thank you very much. So just um, quickly, I, I have not yet received a message from um, the last speaker in the session um, for the, or who's gonna be speaking on the, the last brief announcement to trim stick lower bound for dynamic balance graph partitioning. Um, if, if they are there, please, please contact me. Um, otherwise, we will have time for some more questions <laughs> um, uh, on this talk. Um, I, I, did, I actually had one question. Um, so it's interesting that um, people have considered failures of the senders and receivers um, in terms of noise. Um, I guess just another very obvious type of noise would be channel noise. So like on the channel itself that there's failure. Uh, I, presumably, uh, people have probably also considered that, I guess. Right. How is so, that different? So I think that uh, uh, channel noise is very similar to sender's noise. So uh, let's uh, check out the uh, screen. So uh, yeah, so if we look on this it's case, it's basically the center. Okay, okay, so I guess that makes sense. Noise is, is exactly uh, uh, channel noise. Uh, so well, we skipped the, the talk about the sender's noise. I think in that case they talk about the one hop broadcast. And when you talk about broadcast, maybe it's slightly oh, even uh, even in this case actually it's uh, very similar. So send if the sender is noisy, it's similar to the channel flipping the, the symbol that everybody hears. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, great. Um, okay, it looks like our next speaker is logged in. Uh, Mahmoud, I assume um, you will be speaking. Um, let me, let's go over to that since we're running low on time. Um, thank you, Ron. Um, So, uh, Mahmoud Parham, um, it, uh, it looks like, so I'm, I'm unmuting you. Um, and if you could share your screen for the, um, the next talk will be um, a brief announcement, deterministic lower bound for dynamic balanced graph partitioning.
or um, maybe not. It looks like they've just left. <laughs> uh, so uh, Jennifer, do you see? So you do you see anyone else that has logged in? I, I did a search for everyone on the. No, paper. I just I just checked all the other ones too, and and I saw but, one from Mahmood, but then it disappeared. So okay, yeah, he was on there very briefly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, I guess we're done. Okay. Are there? I, I guess are there any um, final questions uh, for um, for Rand or the or any of the other speakers? We have a few a few more minutes remaining in the session. So actually, I'll ask uh, Ran another question if we have time. Ran, are you still still here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how sensitive uh, are your results to um, the assumption that uh, um, the noises are independent? Um. Yeah, so actually uh, the, the noise uh, is random and we, we count on this because um, when, when the noise is, in the, uh, is not independent, well, you need to uh, put some restrictions on it, right? Uh, assume the noise is adversarial, so how much bits can be flipped? Everything, not everything, 50%, 80%. So I think it's, uh, it depends on the exact model that you define. No, I, I still think about uh, random noise, but with some correlations. Maybe correlations, uh, maybe the nodes are uh, independent of each other, but there are uh, correlations between, uh, I mean, I... Okay, so, so the, main, the main technical uh, issue there is, is a code, is error correcting co code with a good distance. So as long as the error correction code works, I mean, as long as the noise doesn't fail the code, I think it should work. Okay, thanks. Ron, are you yeah. sitting in the, uh, is that the Technion computer science yeah. behind you? Is it, is it? This is Barilan Engineering oh, faculty. Wow. Looks like oh, Technion. And this is the building. My office is uh, here. <laughs> 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 but I'm enjoying the, the wind of, uh, of Israeli summer. Hot and humid Israeli summer. No, no wind. <laughs> I have uh, a, a question, I guess, a quick one. Um, the codes you use, they depend on the parameter P. Do they depend on N, for example? Yes, yes. So, um, so first of all, the, the overhead is log of N. And this okay. means this is because the length of the code is, is uh, linear mm -hmm. in log of N. And um, the distance of the code should depend on, on P, so there is some, some limits uh, on P. I mean, the, the closer P is going to be to half, uh, you will have to use stronger codes, obviously. So you assume a uh, upper bound on the number, number of nodes then to create the codes, if I understand. The, so I, I, if you ask about uh, P again, so um, I think what, what we need, so there is a, a constant there that we are hiding. The constant should be one over a half minus P, something mm. like that. So we should compensate for this. Okay. Thanks. Okay, I am aware that um, the time um, for this session is, is ending. So I am going to, um, stop the recording um, and I want to thank all the speakers and um, the members of the audience for for a great um, session so